together. Uh, today, our primary focus is going to be on very importantly contextualizing uh, women's writing. I'll try to keep this particular session a little brief and still launching you to understanding of women's writing, particularly early women's writing. Uh, so without further ado, let's just quickly get started. And from today onwards, I'll also start uh, posting some other. We, are, we have been posting the concept of the day, uh, but a few other things also. We'll start sharing it on the Telegram platform. So please uh, feel free to stay connected. Now, when we are talking about women writers uh, in the past or in the contemporary world, it is important to understand the trajectory of women's writings, the evolution of women's writings, how we are able to see that women were earlier only the center, the topic of discussion, but how this entire discussion moves from women taking the stronghold and beginning to write their own uh, stories altogether. So earlier, men would only write about women, but here we are able to see that women have started the process of writing themselves. Uh, women have started the process of uh, trying and giving voice uh, to their own individual identity. So that is where women's writings, of course, are becoming important. So let's very briefly look at some important early women writers like Safu, like uh, we are going to be talking about Marjorie Kemp. So let's just very quickly look at it. So Safu, who is famously called as the 10th muse of poetry by Plato. Plato calls her the 10th muse of poetry. We are able to see that she is one of the first earliest women writers. Even though her work is available in fragments, we are able to see that she is one of the foremost writers that we are able to see. So the ancient Greek poet that we are having, Sappho, living in the island of Lesbos, is actually one of the pioneering women writers. And her subject is revolutionary. She's talking about love. She's talking about anxiety in love. She's talking about separation. And uh, even the style, she's inventing the sapphic meter. So a lot of invention, revolutionary content that is coming via Sappho that you're able to see largely, uh, that also makes her really interesting as a figure to actually critically analyze and look at, right? So whenever we are looking at, whenever we are talking about the way that Sappho's writings, the way that Sappho's writings are actually progressing, uh, the way that we're able to see that how uh, Sappho's writing, she's actually giving a benchmark uh, or becoming one of the first foremost writers uh, who is carrying the beat on uh, uh, forward for all the other women writers to come in. Uh, Sappho, of course, was also leading this entire circle of female disciples. So she was le leading this, uh, this entire cult, so to say, the cult of women disciples that we were able to see and uh, uh, you know her work is actually surviving in fragments we are having fragments if you actually go and search they're genuinely fragments of her works that are surviving right now so that is another question that we can ask that you know what about women's writings uh, are the publishing is the publishing taking place in a very serious way or at that time if publishing was not there is recording as serious as probably a men uh, would, would probably be recorded so those are questions that women writers are of course, engaging in. All right. Majority of her writing is love poetry. She's also writing epigrams. Epigrams are concise statements like two atis. Two atis, which was translated by Richard Allington. Richard Allington, HD, all your <coughs> images, right? All your writers associated with imagism were really inspired by Sappho's style of writing. Why? Because Sappho was using epigrams and even these people wanted concise writing. They even they wanted concise writing. So that is the reason we were able to see that Sappho is also largely uh, becoming the center of attraction for all of these 20th century writers. Uh, so Sappho, like, uh, like I mentioned by Plato, was called the 10th muse. Uh, extremely innovative first person narrative that we're able to see. And she's interacting with gods. She's, she's literally approaching Aphrodite. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, is actually being addressed very directly. There's a direct address to Aphrodite. Aphrodite, the cult that she's creating. So there's there's a direct address that we're able to see that is being made to Aphrodite altogether. And she's revolutionizing the subject matter, the usage of the language, the content and the subject matter both are getting revolutionized. The subject matter is getting revolutionized and the content is also getting revolutionized. Right? So we're able to see that she is uh, the subject matter is like you know, love, passion, jealousy, affection, hatred. 
and when we are looking at her subject matter not just the subject matter but also style she is inventing the sapphic meter so a great pioneering women writer because she's taking ownership she's taking ownership of experimenting both with subject matter uh, both with the use of language that we are able to see and that is the beauty that is the beauty of sappho how sappho and that's the reason plato is calling her the 10th muse right so that that of course uh, becomes uh, important for all of us to keep in mind so always remember always keep this in mind that whenever we are looking at sappho whenever we are talking about sappho sappho is sort of setting the edifice for women's writings to take the pedestal forward altogether this is from attis attis far from me manadisika dwells in sardis many times she was near us so that we lived life well like the far a far famed goddess whom above all things music delight so that's the kind of translations that you're able to see but of course she's talking about a uh, female camaraderie she's talking about feminine love that is something that sappho is predominantly talking about now the second after sappho the second important early women writings that we're able to see is morasaki and li ching chao li ching chao and morasaki they are talking talking about love again uh, but they are not just talking about like sappho was talking about a women's love camaraderie uh, coming from the island of lesbos and that is where lesbianism is also coming but here morasaki and li ching chao li ching chao and morasaki are talking uh, more about love uh, particular see understand these were the experiences they were not going out they were not working uh, so they they were trying to describe their own experiences and chinese society was actually developing what ha what was happening is with printing coming in place you saw a lot of educated chinese women a lot of educated uh, chinese women were predominantly um, you know getting the access to study read and they were teaching their uh, their their young uh, children also not just that you were able to see that there was this entire discussion discourse platform that was opening up so what were we able to see we were able to see that china was also at the uh, epicenter of giving us some of the early fe female writings that we were able to see uh, some of the early women centric writings that are coming in so that is something that uh, we are able to see that you know are coming uh, via china uh, now uh, the lady morasaki one of uh, japan so japan's most admired authors but please remember to look at chinese culture the japanese culture the eastern culture uh, the eastern culture how you are able to see how you are able to see that the eastern culture was also becoming one of the primary ways uh, through which like you know pub with the publishing uh, with women's education and and the requirement that women have to be educated to in order to teach the younger minds that was becoming very prominent over there that was becoming very very prominent over there uh, even in india when you're looking at uh, um, you know uh, when you, when you're looking at uh, vedmati uh, vidya lankar or when you're looking at uh, a lot of these women centric people even tarabai shinde and a lot of these women who are at the forefront trying to create a different cadre of identity for women right uh, being educated being well read rash sundari devi ram guha ram chandra guha talks about rash sundari devi that how difficult it was to get herself educated she would actually silently go um, uh, and and you know sit in chambers in very secret isolation and then get herself educated so that is something which is coming in so do try to explore that's also really interesting if you're interested in women's studies you'll be able to answer that better so lady morasaki japan's a very important writer the tale of genji is also telling you about romantic relationships complex romantic relationships so love is becoming so when we are talking about morasaki or when we are looking at the writing of li ching chao we're able to see that they they're, they're talking about love that's the primary area okay of course we have these translations so this is a part of your world literature tale of genji is a part of world literature as well uh, morasaki's account is actually trying to tell you about the experiences um, about the 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 various kinds of relationships that she was able to see the men women roles uh, particularly in a very male dominated society you come to know about those fixed gender roles 
fixed gender identities that is something that Murasaki is talking about. And Li Ching Chao, very important, also called as Queen Zhao, um, is very famous Chinese. That's the reason I'm saying go over Chinese, Japanese, and Eastern tradition. Very famous Chinese women poet that we're talking about, right? So Murasaki as well as Li Ching Chao, both of them are very important. Murasaki coming from Japan and Li Ching Chao coming from China. Okay, uh, there, there is this uh, Cambridge Illustrated History of China in which you are able to see Patricia Ebre, uh, Pat Patricia Buckley Ebre talks about how with the arrival of the printing press, how with the coming of the printing press, you were able to see that women were also becoming educated, uh, women were also uh, getting an upper edge altogether and we were able to see that they were also getting access to knowledge and that's the reason they were becoming writers of sorts. Uh, but predominantly Permanently, why were they reading? They were reading to provide support to their kids. They were reading to provide support to their kids. But that, that was helpful because that leads to the development of uh, Li Ching Chao, Morasaki, becoming educated and then writing for posterity altogether. Li Ching Chao's poetry is very popular. According to, uh, you know, a critic, Wu Chi, he, uh, Wu Chi talks about how the poems, you know, uh, if you compare it uh, even with other contemporaries, it's actually uh, something which will lead a very everlasting impact and she's talking about emotions she's talking about vicissitudes compare this with what had come in your shift one this time elaine showalter's gyno criticism how you're able to talk about creating women's canon because women talking about themselves is always going to be more important women's canon becomes very important here so talking about emotions vicissitudes of a young woman then the third major category of early women writers, Julian of Norwich. Again, here there is an expression of love for God, right? So Sappho or Morasaki or Li Ching Chao, they were talking about love. Uh, Sappho talking about women uh, love within uh, like, you know, their own community. Then uh, Morasaki and Li Ching Chao talking about man-women relationships and love there in the courtship period um, and, and as well as courtiers. But Julian of Norwich is telling you about love for God right there's a different kind of love there's a matrimony with god uh, so women exploring the religious slant of writing that is something which is coming so you're able to see unlike morasaki and li ching chao unlike morasaki and li ching chao we are able to see that when we are looking at writers not just like julian of norwich but also like marjorie kemp they are trying to go towards the religious side of love right they are trying to go uh, towards the religious side of love that is what they are looking at so what are we able to see we are able to see that she talks about her relationship with jesus she's looking at her relationship with jesus christ that is something which morasaki and Li Ching chawa talking about uh saint Teresa of avila right a very very famous renaissance woman uh, uh you, you are able to see you know uh, portrayed themselves as brides of christ brides of christ so you're getting married you're getting married to jesus christ that's the matrimony that you are you're, you're literally talking about getting married to god uh so so that is something which becomes really important so julian of norwich julian of norwich one of the first female writers in english in english to come because sappho murasaki Li ching chao they were not writing in english sappho was writing in ancient classical greek language and here we're able to see that julian of Na norwich is one of the first females to actually write in english She's describing a book of showings, a book of showings. And a book of showings is trying to tell us about the various visions of God, the various visions of God. For, for the religious writers, visions are very important. Visions are very critical. They're getting visions of God. They're getting these visions of God, which are becoming extremely important uh, for all of us to understand. Marjorie Kemp, another important uh, early women writer, Marjorie Kemp, you're able to see uh, again coming at the epicenter. Uh, so, so very important. By uh, juice uh, sorry, uh, very, very important here to actually, I'm just trying to hide myself so that all of you can actually see the, the book and the title as well. So Marjorie Kemp is also another important writer that we are having. Kemp was also, uh, you know, an English female writer an english female writer uh, she was writing about her spiritual life in the book of marjorie kemp the book of marjorie kemp so visions book of showing by julian of norwich and here this is telling you about the spiritual journey the spiritual life altogether the book of marjorie kemp and uh, you know she's talking
talking about a very personalized relationship with God. By the way, even Sappho for that matter. Sappho is also trying to describe her individual journey with Aphrodite. Like for instance, you're reaching out to your God. You're reaching out to your uh, to your uh, deity, that you're, de deity that you're praying to. You're reaching out to them. And why are you reaching out to them? To just like, you know, completely elevate your goals, to mitigate all your problems, to figure out solutions altogether. So you're reaching out. What are you essentially doing? You're essentially trying to reach out. And that's something that even Aphrodite does. Aphrodite also, there's a direct mention. Um, she is trying to reach out to her angel god or angel spirit of sorts right and after 20 years of uh, marriage so what happened was with marjorie camp after 20 years of marriage and having 14 children marjorie camp actually spoke to her husband the description i'll probably post it on the telegram platform that entire conversation also is really uh, a very uh, uh, acute conversation that is taking place she literally has a bargain she says that you know now I've, that i've done this i really need to get to another path altogether she makes this decision she makes this decision to give away her 20 years of marriage to come to the path of God. So that's like a sort of a spiritual assertion. It's very difficult. So compare Marjorie Kemp with Nora. Nora's banging of the door in the doll's house by Henry Kepson in the 19th century can actually be compared to Marjorie Kemp's decision to give voice to a spiritual life and abandoning her marriage. There, of course, we are able to see that Nora is abandoning her marriage for a different reason or, you know, the slamming, uh, slamming of the door. But here you can always compare and there are research papers on the scene. So you can see that Marjorie Kemp also is actually renouncing a 20 years of marriage with 14 kids um, and, and trying to say that, you know, that association can actually be replaced with her association with God. Right. Uh, Marjorie Kemp is actually giving us the first English autobiography that is written in vernacular language, that is written in vernacular language altogether. The visions, the pilgrimages that she is undergoing, everything is getting captured. Everything, each and every journey is pure and the love for God is actually coming across right so you're able to see that we're getting a proper account of how the 15th century england life was uh, what were the day-to-day -day concerns of people we come to know about that so she is replacing her physical marriage to the mystical marriage with jesus christ right and and that is what she says that you know jesus christ is the love of my life so replacing a physical marriage with a marriage to god almighty now, the last portion that we're able to see, the last portion is about rewriting the oral tradition. We are looking at how women's writings are trying to go back to the oral traditions. There is a revisiting of the oral traditions that we are able to see. Now, what do we mean by this? What do we mean by revisiting the oral tradition? What do we mean by going back to the oral tradition? What does it essentially mean? Now, basically, what does this mean? Basically, what are we trying to say? You need to understand this, that when we talk about rewriting oral traditions, oral traditions, masculine traditions, written traditions, they are always having a patriarchal slant. And you are trying to give an opinion and you're getting women's concerns at the center. So writers like Carol and Duffy or writers uh, who are immersed, even, even for that matter, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at um, Angela Carter. They're trying to rework. They're trying to rework the tradition, which is having patriarchal biases. So folk tales, folk stories. Now you must have seen fairy tales, um, which, which are now getting a very feminist slant altogether. It's very interesting to read. This is all a part of popular culture, by the way. Right. So now earlier, what will we have earlier? we had the fairy tales where you were able to see that the woman was waiting for her uh, prince charming to come but now it'll be like a reworked cinderella story even very recently the movie that came in uh, which was giving you like uh, cinderella wanting to open her own business right rather than waiting for um, the prince charming to come or uh, so so that is what you're able to see that these folk tales these folk stories are getting a very different bent uh, uh, altogether. 17th century French author uh, Charles Perrault had also given us a version of Cinderella. So this version we are all familiar with how Cinderella, uh, you know, the fairy godmother comes in, she goes to the party and then, you know, she, she has to be back by 12, before 12 o'clock, she leaves her shoe pair uh, over there. So everything is like really important over here that how you're trying to rework that, how you're trying to rework these, uh, these so-called narratives. Angela Carter also, Angela Carter has also told a couple of fairy tales in the bloody chamber. 
and American Ghosts and Old Wonders. So in the bloody chamber, it, this is revisiting. You are revisiting. There is a revisiting, revisionist writing. You're not happy with the original style of writing and you're, you're trying to give it a woman, women-centric slant. Even Carol Ann Duffy, the world's wife, talks about Little Red Cap. This is a retelling of Little Red, Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood is actually uh, getting uh, enraptured by the wolf. But here, uh, the woman is taking care. Why, why would it be that women are always associated with innocence, uh, with being gullible? That is something which is being changed over here in these narratives. That is something that we are able to see that gets changed over here. Right? So, Little Red Riding Hood, we are able to see there's a complete reworking, very psychological bent that is given. So primarily, I just wanted, like I said at the very beginning, I'll keep today's class like super brief so that all of you can enjoy your festivities. But considering this class was planned, so I thought rather than canceling it, at least let's study some parts of it. Uh, what I want you to focus on is I'm just sharing a few names, just a few names. We'll go back, we'll revisit, we as it is have to revisit modernist text, all right? Uh, and there is a shout out that I have only one submission I got for the homework. And that too at, uh, you know, midnight, post midnight. So I'll just uh, give a shout out to the person. But this is a catalog. You can go over this uh, during your Diwali break if you want to. Carol Ann Duffy, Anon and White Writing, Emilia Groshals, uh, Margaret Atwood, Adrian and Bridge, Erica Young, Toni Morrison, Sylvia Platt, Stevie Smith. Baba Love Baby. So these are, uh, this is a list and of course I'll be adding more names to this particular list who are a part of, you know, your women's writing syllabuses from across. So if you want to go over these, uh, please feel free to go over. And before I end, uh, there's a huge shout out. I think there was only one submission by Ropesh uh, on what homework I'd given you yesterday. Uh, but that's perfectly all right. It's just like, uh, of course, I'm, I'm just trying to, um, like, I don't want to be like a sort of a collector of homeworks of sorts. But it's just to make sure that all of you are actually studying in a very systematic way. Uh, so kudos to Ropesh. That was the only submission that we got. Uh, shout out for him. Please, I would recommend all of you complete your previous homework. And that's your homework only. Uh, please relax during these three days. Uh, try to review all the sessions that we have done in the past week uh, or so. Uh, there have been YouTube sessions as well as app sessions even after your exams. So I would recommend all of you to start focusing at least on both the app sessions and the YT sessions after 13th October. At least cover them end to end. We'll go back to all all the topics that are uh, you know that are not complete. I'll also try and send some more material like new criticism. Of course, I'll be sharing it. That was discussed in the Friday's app session, the free app session that we had done. So that I'll be sharing it on the Telegram platform. And any posts also that we make, we'll share it on the Telegram platform. Wishing you all a very very happy festive season. Uh, may God bless each one of you uh, with abundant growth, prosperity, and happiness this uh, this year and. Uh, of course, wisdom and uh, a lot of health to all of you. Uh, please take good care of yourselves. And if there are any other concerns, please feel free to visit uh, your Baijus exam prep application. And in the doubts platform, uh, you can you can always mention your doubts. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take good care of yourselves. Uh... Yes, yes, yes. Anne Carson has also written a collection of essays, right? Enna on Sappho's fragments called Eros the Bittersweet. Very good. No worries, Minika. Uh, good morning, Shalini. Radha. Uh, Radha, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Good morning, Prabhu, Pooja, Shalini, Lichi, Chuhi, Gaurav. All right, wishing you all a very happy Diwali. Take good care of yourselves. And if there are any other concerns, like I said, please feel free to share them with us. We'll be more than happy to help you out with those, right? All right, on that note, let's just uh, call it a day today early. And all of you, happy cleaning. Happy Diwali, Juhi, Pooja. All right, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, do shopping in moderation. Don't over shop also because then we feel bad. All right, thanks everyone. Take good care of yourselves. I'll catch up with all of you very, very soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rupesh. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.